Lost History tells the story of reporters who broke the secret Contra operation in Iran. Author and journalist Robert Perry was assigned to report that incident, which came to be known as Iran-Contra. During his talk, Mr. Perry explains how similar stories went underreported by the media during the 1980s. In particular, he mentions Nicaraguan cocaine trafficking and the Guatemalan genocide of Mayan Indians. Mr. Perry was at a bookstore in Washington, D.C. for this hour-long presentation. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. Um, we're very delighted to have Robert Perry back with us again to talk about his book, um, the, This Is It, Lost History. And it's about the Contras and uh, going back into history and discussing uh, what were the, some of the secrets around the activity of the United States in Nicaragua and why the United States took such a great interest in, the, in, in helping the Contras. So um, Bob is a magazine editor and he is, uh, they are revamping a magazine which they are calling American Dispatches and it will be on the newsstand in perhaps a week, a week or so, and you can get it at Politics and Prose. So um, we're glad to have you with us today. Well, thank you. Look forward to this. Oh, I forgot to say, I'm Carla Cohen. I'm one of the owners of Politics and Prose, and I welcome you <coughs> all here today. Well, thank you, Carla, for that introduction. Um, and thanks for turning out on a Saturday afternoon here. Um, perhaps one of the first questions people might ask about uh, my new book, Lost History, is why I would want to go back and look at this difficult period of American history, the, um, the period around the, uh, the Contra War in Nicaragua. And that is sort of the focus of the book, although it does go off in uh, other directions and talks about what's happened to the American news media, uh, and is, is more current in that sense. Uh, but uh, it's my feeling that the, that the war in, in Nicaragua that was fought in the 1980s uh, was an important moment in our history, uh, one in which uh, the United States government took a fairly aggressive position, uh, supporting a, a, an insurgency force, the Contras, to overthrow a leftist government in Nicaragua, the Sandinistas. The, the, one of the problems with the war, however, was that the Contras were involved in some very unsavory activities. Uh, the most notable um, that in terms of the controversies that have swirled around them uh, was the problem of, uh, of uh, Contra drug trafficking. And this has been an issue that has lingered really since the mid-1980s and has never been dealt with with the, uh, with the degree of honesty and thoroughness that it should have. Because when the United States engages in uh, an activity of this sort um, and then tries to cover up some of the consequences, it says something about the relationship between the American people and, and, and the government, as well as the American people and their press corps. Because the American public counts on the, on the press corps to, to a great degree to inform them and alert them about problems of this kind. And the way the press handled it, this issue, is almost equally troubling to the, uh, to the actual problem itself. But perhaps I should just start by going back to the beginning of this war and showing what we now know. There's a great deal now that's on the public record, but there's a great deal that the American people have not really been told about this public record. We now know, based on, the, on testimony that was given to the United States Senate, uh, as well as investigations done by the Central Intelligence Agency itself, that the problems of the Contras and drug trafficking went back to the very beginnings of that operation. Back even before Ronald Reagan became president. According to testimony by an Argentine intelligence officer, Leonardo Sanchez Ruiz, given to, the, uh, to a Senate investigation and kept secret, uh, the, the real problem begins in 1980 at a time when the Argentine government is controlled by a, a right-wing military force which has been engaged in a dirty war itself. 
The Argentines saw their role, though, in fighting communism as going beyond simply dealing with uh, their own internal leftist problem. They, they saw their role as being part of an international effort uh, to go after leftists and dissidents uh, around the region and really around the world. In 1980, they also became involved with a, a, an effort to have a coup d'etat in Bolivia. Uh, the Bolivian government at that time was democratically left, uh, elected, somewhat left of center, and, the, and, and there were efforts to overthrow it by the, uh, by the Bolivian military. And the Bolivian military was working in collaboration at that point with the Roberto Suarez uh, drug cartel. Suarez was one of the original uh, drug lords in South America in terms of uh, the cocaine trafficking problem that was just really beginning, just beginning to take shape at that point. And, we, and from the testimony of Leonardo Sanchez Reese, who was uh, an Argentine intelligence officer involved in these operations, moving their money, uh, we, we now know that, the, that Suarez provided roughly $30 million that was going to be used to overthrow the government of Bolivia. And it was. There was, uh, there was a, a very bloody um, uh, coup d'etat, which became known as the cocaine coup, because it put in charge of Bolivia effectively uh, uh, a group of drug-connected uh, military officers, and they essentially held power for two years. But Sanchez Reese also says that as part of this, this $30 million in laundered drug money, some of that went to support in t uh, paramilitary operations in Central America, including the beginnings of the Contra operation. And as we know, the Argentines moved from Bolivia, where they helped support that coup, onto Honduras, where they helped set up the Contras. So what we now know in terms of the record, as, as, as this Argentine officer put it forward, is that the Contras really were conceived in, in, in the money from the drug trade. And it went on from there. The sanchez Reese operation in Bolivia became the source of raw coca, which was then delivered to, um, to a, a, a growing, uh, or then a, a beginning small business uh, cartel called the Medellin Cartel which used that as a supply of coca for development of the, of, of the trade to the United States, which became one of the principal sources of cocaine that was coming into the United States at the time. So these connections go back very early. We also know that uh, now based uh, from what the Central Intelligence Agency reported uh, in, a, in, a, in a report uh, la uh, in the fall of 1998, that the, uh, that the, that the that there was also connections between the Contras, Cuban-Americans supporting the Contras, and the Medellin cartel. Uh, and that those operations go back also very early into the Contra War, back into the early 80s. Now, as this, as this was taking shape, uh, the, um, in the United States, there were some complaints about, from Congress and, and from uh, public interest groups about the Contras. There were concerns about uh, um, them engaging in human rights violations. Uh, and there was, a, there was a battle inside Congress about whether or not the funding should continue. While the, while the focus at the, in, those early, in that early period was on, was on questions about international law and uh, human rights violations, there was always this thread of, the, at least internally now inside the U.S. government, of concern about some of the people the United States was engaged with. Uh, we now know, based on the, on the documents that have come forward, that the CIA knew way before we did. In, in the Washington press corps that, that this was a serious problem. Uh, they were finding things out, but not, of course, making them public. Uh, at the time, I was with the Associated Press, and I, I was covering uh, intelligence activities, uh, and as it turned out, the, the, the Contra War in Central America. And that led us to stumble into a number of the problems that the Contras were having as we were reporting on their activities. I did a story about, um, about uh, some manuals that the CIA prepared for the Contras uh, on how to conduct sabotage inside Nicaragua, and one that was interpreted as uh, an assassina assassination manual. Uh, at, well, while with the AP, uh, I also began working with Brian Barger, who was hired uh, by the AP to help out in this, on this project. And, and Brian had very excellent contacts with the uh, mercenary community that was working with the Contras. So he provided uh, additional sourcing uh, from, from really the ground in Central America and in Miami 
and many of my sources were more focused here in Washington. But one of Brian's sources um, began to indicate that he was aware of, of a problem with drug trafficking, an issue we really didn't want to hear about. We were having enough trouble trying to cover the stories as they were developing. We were at that point working on, um, on the activities of a fellow who wasn't that well known at that time. His name was Oliver North. And, and I w I'd written a story back in 1985, a very sketchy story, about Norse um, activities inside the White House, trying to secretly keep the Contra War going, despite the congressional opposition. But when we went down to, um, to pursue some of those stories, we also learned about more and more about this drug trafficking problem. So uh, Brian and I wrote the first story in, the, in December of 1985 about the Contra drug activity. Um, the, the U.S. government flatly denied that our story was true. The State Department said there was no evidence to support our, our, our assertions in the AP story. And we went on from there facing this increasing effort to try to stop us from doing those, those articles. Um, and and much, of the, much of the other Washington press corps um, felt that there may not be as much to it as we did. Uh, I'm not sure if their sourcing was weak or if they just didn't want to get into it. But it, it, it was something that we were learning about in greater and greater detail as we went forward. Our stories also stirred uh, Senator John Kerry in Massachusetts to begin his own investigation of the Contra drug problem and other criminal activities by the Contras. And he began to learn more and more. Throughout this period, though, the, the, the Reagan administration kept insisting there was nothing to it. Uh, uh, Kerry uh, faced uh, opposition at, uh, within the executive branch when he asked for information. Uh, we now know that the CIA was learning a great deal at this time. And contrary to, the, contrary to the assertions of the administration that there was no evidence of this, they were in fact developing enormous amounts of evidence. And they knew, far more than we did, that this was, this was a serious problem. They knew, for instance, that among the Cuban Americans who were working with the Contras, uh, one, of, one of the individuals, uh, Felipe Vidal, was working directly for the Central Intelligence Agency. And the agency knew that he was involved with a drug money laundering operation and also smuggling operation down in Costa Rica called Frigoríficos de Punta Arenas. Uh, there was another Cuban American involved in that operation uh, named Moises Nunez. He was working directly for the National Security Council. And when the CIA interviewed him in 1987, as these stories kept bubbling forward, this, he told the CIA that he could not talk about his, his, his drug activity because it involved work he was doing for the National Security Council. So we had this problem that was directly into the White House at that point, the highest levels of the U.S. government. The CIA, interestingly, when after uh, Nunez told them this, they decided not to ask any more questions about it because their responsibility was to check on the CIA's involvement with drug activity. And since Nunez was working for the National Security Council, they felt that it was not worth pursuing. But they continued then to hold back other information as Congress was asking uh, what the story was with some of these individuals who were being named in press accounts. Repeatedly, the, uh, the CIA said we, that they knew nothing. They've now since admitted, uh, more than a decade later, that they actually had a great deal of evidence and information about these, these folks. So we had here a case where the U.S. government, at the highest levels, was protecting these kinds of drug operatives. The CIA has also admitted now that it was aware of uh, investigations that were underway in San Francisco and elsewhere, where, where the CIA went to the prosecutors and said, don't pursue these lines of inquiry because they might be politically embarrassing to us. And there was a case called the so-called so -called Frogman case in San Francisco involving a number of uh, uh, drug operatives who had brought uh, cocaine uh, into the Bay Area through, by, by boat and through... Um, by having people dress up like frogmen and swim it in, that the CIA decided that this was a case that could very well have implicated the Costa Rican front of the Contra War. So they, 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 they told the prosecutor in, uh, in, in San Francisco to not pursue it, and he agreed. So we had actual cases now of, of, of where the CIA was obstructing investigations into this drug trafficking. We also had cases where the... Um, where the, where the U.S. government knew that, that these problems existed at the very highest levels. Yet the effort was always to contain the story 
And the reason the Reagan administration wanted to contain it so much was because it was trying to get Congress to resume aid to the Contras during this period. And obviously, this kind of information would have been, would have been highly uh, disadvantageous to that effort. So we had, we had a situation where the, the Contra War was then refunded uh, in 1986. But the Iran-Contra scandal broke, and so the, the administration then became concerned that if this additional evidence came out, it could lead to the impeachment of President Reagan. So we saw a strong effort across the board to contain this material. Uh, and as this went, went through, one of the allies that the Reagan administration found, surprisingly, I suppose, to some, was much of the Washington press corps. While there were cases where the Associated Press, um, CBS News, and a few other organizations did pursue these stories, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other major news organizations went the other way. They began to dismiss the, the evidence, dismiss the witnesses, uh, claim that there wasn't really anything here. Uh, the New York Times, uh, in particular, wrote stories about how the witnesses were all uh, convicted drug traffickers, or that they, they never said anything about this problem until after the Iran-Contra scandal broke. Both were not true. The, uh, the fact is that we had written our first story at the AP in the, in the fall of 1985, almost a year before the Iran-Contra scandal broke. And many of the witnesses were not, uh, were not drug traffickers. Some were DEA officers. Some were people who'd been working with the Contras and were not involved in legal troubles uh, in the United States. But those kinds of stories helped contain this scandal. And pretty much the scandal went under wraps. The, um, the Congress did not pursue it during the Iran-Contra investigation. It was left to Senator Kerry to work on. Um, Senator Kerry did go forward with, with hearings under tremendous pressure to stop them. Um, those hearings produced a good deal of, of supportive evidence. Uh, Senator Kerry discovered that, that four of the groups that had been hired by the United States government to work with the Contras were also implicated in drug trafficking. So he had evidence, and, and, but again, the, the Washington Press Corps decided to downplay it. When his report came out in 1989, it was essentially buried on the back pages. Uh, dismissed and almost ridiculed. And that's pretty much where the story rested. There, it, did, it flared up again in 1990 and 91 uh, after the invasion of Panama and the arrest of Manuel Noriega and his trial. Um, obviously the United States had worked closely with Noriega during the Contra War and, and then later arrested him for drug trafficking. And, and when he was put on trial, the U.S. government actually brought forward some of the same witnesses who testified before Kerry and had been dismissed as not being credible, and they put them on to testify against Noriega on drug trafficking allegations as credible. So we had this sort of strange dichotomy where on one side a witness who talked about Noriega in one setting was, was telling the truth about drug trafficking, but when he mentioned the Contras, his evidence was dismissed. And this is pretty much where it all rested until 1996. And that was when a reporter out in San Francisco, Gary Webb of the San Jose Mercury News, decided he would do a story based on some information from a case out there uh, regarding how the contra, some of the contra cocaine had gotten into the crack epidemic. And his story had some flaws in some ways, perhaps it was a bit overstated in, in different areas and he didn't perhaps put all the background in he could, but the story was essentially on target. And it represented a serious threat to the, uh, to the Washington press corps which had pretty much dismissed this for a number of years. So the way the Washington Press Corps then responded to it was interesting. First, they tried to ignore it, uh, but it pick, was picked up on the internet quite a bit. The uh, Congressional Black Caucus made a big issue out of it. Um, black Americans really across the country were furious over this possibility that the, that the CIA and the US government had in some way helped the crack epidemic move forward. So after a brief time, the Washington Press Corps then decided to attack Gary Webb and his story, and did so quite aggressively. Uh, uh, the Contra drug story had never appeared on the front page of the Washington Post until it was written up as a, in, in the context of attacking Gary Webb for writing about it. The New York Times did pretty much the same thing. Uh, the LA Times followed suit as well. And interestingly, all those stories would say, somewhere if you read them far enough, that oh, everyone knew about the Contra drug trafficking. It was an old story back from the 1980s. 
And there was some truth to it, but not what Gary Webb was saying. That became the official position of the Washington Press Corps. Now, the problem was that the, that the CIA agreed to investigate, and as did the Justice Department. And they began looking back into this issue. The, um, uh, and the CIA did a fairly honest job. Uh, Inspector General Fre uh, Frederick Hitz um, went back and collected much of this evidence and began piecing it together into a report, actually a two-volume report. The first volume dealt with the California issue, which Gary Webb had raised, and, was, and basically said that, that Webb had overstated some points, but that there were problems. And, and uh, the Inspector General recounts the effort by the CIA to stop the, the San Francisco drug investigation, for instance. Uh, so on the record, we, we now knew that there was this effort by the CIA, which had always been denied as having existed. We also knew that, that, a, that a, um, a letter had been written by the Attorney General, Attorney General Smith, in 1982, at the request of CIA Director William Casey, that protected the CIA from any requirement from reporting on drug trafficking by its, by its operatives, the so-called letter of uh, memo of understanding. And in this, there is clear indication that the CIA did not want to be called on to report this problem at that time in, the, in that period of 1982. Obviously, it wasn't just the Contras they, they may have been concerned about. There were problems with the Afghan rebels as well in terms of their involvement with the heroin trade. But the CIA was given uh, permission by the Justice Department not to pursue any of this. Uh, but we also then find out further when the Justice Department comes out with a separate report, and then later when there's a volume two of the CIA report. And these reports provide even more detail, more damning evidence, that there had been a long-standing effort to contain these allegations, uh, and that DEA officials in Central America were being uh, stopped from looking into problems, uh, and and that, that there had been a, a real effort to protect the people doing the drug trafficking. And when the agency learned that there were people that it was working with involved in the drug trade, they protected them and kept that information from Congress and the American public. So we get to the end of the story in 1998 and, um, with this report coming out. And the CIA posted the report on October 8, 1998 on its website. And uh, I've been covering the story for a long time, and I thought it was very important to sort of to be to get it out, to uh, read what was reported there, and and do a story about it. And I thought there'd be a lot of competition because finally the CIA was coming out with this remarkable document, uh, perhaps one of the most remarkable documents ever produced by any U.S. government agency. But there was no competition really to do that story. The New York Times did a brief brief piece a couple days later, uh, inside the paper did not go into the details of what was being disclosed. Uh, the Washington Post didn't write anything for almost a month. Uh, the LA Times never wrote anything about the report after it, was after it was released. And so the American people never got to understand what had happened uh, in this very serious moment of our history when the US government let itself become involved with some very unsavory operatives. The press basically joined in the cover-up uh, so one of the purposes of the book Lost History is to sort of go back and try to st establish this record. The idea of lost history is that, that these, these are facts that are on the public record. They're in black and white. The problem is that the American public has not been given this information in any coherent way, uh, which has been a real failure of the, of the Washington Press Corps. Uh, and the book also deals uh, with how that happened, what, what was, the changes that occurred in the Washington Press Corps during this period, the pressure it was under in the 1980s not to pursue these kinds of stories. Um, but, the, but the overall point is that the American people really deserve to know what their government did, even in difficult times, even when the government was acting improperly. And that this idea that these things can be sort of swept under the rug when they're as serious as the U.S. government's being involved in criminal activity is something that that really should not be allowed to go forward. So the book is an effort to, to say to that that uh, the American people have a right to know and that, um, that this is a way to bring that all together and present it to them. And we thank you very much. Do you want to have questions? Of course. 
Any questions? Yes. What was David. the uh, motivation of the Cuban American community being involved uh, back in the 80s? Was it political, trying to bring down the, the um, Sandinistas? Uh, uh, or was it a profit motive for their own anti-Castro activities? Or well, I think it was a combination of things. The uh, the the, uh, the Cuban American community obviously has a very strong feeling about about communism, about uh, revolutionary movements because they they were on the losing side in Cuba, and the uh, uh, and having become involved with the CIA during the Bay of Pigs era back in the early '60s, th there was this tie into the U.S. intelligence community that was very strong. Um, the 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 Cuban Americans in some cases, obviously not many, but in a limited area, did become involved in drug trafficking as well. Um, and that became an embarrassment for, this, for the U.S. government and the CIA for some time because many of its operatives uh, in the Cuban-American community were, were later implicated in drug trafficking. Uh, and when those people went into the Contra movement to help out the Contras, it was partly, I think, um, ideological and, uh, and philosophical, but it was also a business opportunity because it was many of those Cuban Americans who were involved in the drug trade who, in going down to Central America, brought their business with them. And they found that, the, that the, using the cover of the Contra War protected them uh, from uh, U.S. investigation and possibly prosecution. Uh, and we now know be, the people like uh, Felipe Vidal and, and Luis Nunez, who are described in the CIA report as being involved in this business, um, were, were, the, were Cuban Americans who, had, who found a, a joint opportunity here. You had cases also of, uh, of a man named Frank Castro who was described in the, in the agency's report as being essentially the Contra's tie-in to, uh, uh, to the Medellin cartel. The, um, and, and Frank Castro was, had, had a history of, of drug trafficking and the, US, and the U.S. government was concerned when he became that involved. But it didn't really stop him because this, this, this importance politically of the Contra War was so great that in all these cases, the White House turned the other way and, and let it go forward rather than uh, blow the whistle on their operatives. Yes, sir. My name is David Martin, and I think you've really um, hit the nail on the head when you, you say that the real problem is with our press, with their honesty, with their thoroughness. Um, and uh, and that the press joined in the cover-up, but I, I think you you isolate your argument. I've looked at your book. Um, I voted for Bill Clinton back in 1992 because I wanted to get rid of the corruption, and and uh, and then I look at your website and I I read this. You wrote in April 17th, 1999, talking about Senator Faircloth and some other conservatives were promoting wild suspicions that Vince Foster had been murdered. On February 26, 1999, Richard Mellon Scaife chastised Starr for failing to prove some of the wilder Clinton conspiracy theories, such as dark suspicions about the suicide of Deputy White House Counsel Winston Foster. On December 5, 1998, you wrote, some conservatives were pushing vague conspiracy theories about Foster's murder. And about four years ago, our mutual friend, I don't know if he's a friend of yours, a friend of mine, uh, Ernest Fitzgerald, uh, the Pentagon whistleblower, gave me your name and phone number and said, because I, I went to college with Vincent Foster and was very interested in the case. And I, I was digging up lots of things and it was going in the drawer because there was nobody to talk to. Talk to uh, Ernest Fitzgerald. He's very persuasive of what I'd found. He said, call Robert Perry, this honest journalist. And I called you. I left a message. I, I didn't get any response. You never, I don't know if, what happened with the answer machine. But information well, well, that contradicts what you've said here is as near as the click of a mouse. Well, I've looked at that issue. Well, and I have since written 150 pages called America's Dreyfus Affair, the case of the death of Vincent Foster. And I don't know if you've looked at that. People can mail me. If they think anything I've said is wrong, they can email me. Well, I've sure. heard nothing from well, you. Well, I've written about this. You've obviously seen my, my, my reporting on the website. But the, uh, I've looked at the Vince Foster case, and I've concluded that he died pretty much as the other authorities said he did, that he committed suicide at Fort Marcy Park, that, there, that none of the other uh, supposed theories can hold water. The, what, what, what many people do is they, they get into the so-called anomaly situation where they'll try to find, they'll poke holes in things, but 
No one has presented to me any serious evidence that that Vince Foster was murdered or that he was killed or he died elsewhere and was transported to Fort Marcy Park. Well, you, you, okay, you, you've had your chance. You, you play right into the role of it. It's just conservatives, it's just a bunch of crazy right-wing no, conservatives. No, no, I know, I know people who yeah. are not conservatives. I'm not a right-wing conservative. I, I understand I that. But examine the evidence and I'll tell you, you're completely wrong. Well, I've examined the evidence too and I, if, if, if there was something there, I would have tried to say it. But, I, but I've read a lot on this topic. That's yeah, enough. well... Did you read it? Yes, I read the Star Report. Did you see the 20-page addendum that went with it? Are you familiar with that? Well, I mean... You, you know what I'm talking about? Well, I just want to know, are you familiar with that? Why is it that this question takes over the entire... Okay, all right. All right, sir. Well, I like the title of your book, Lost History. In my view, by the late 40s, with the establishment of the national security state, history became a commodity of the state and not something that belonged to the people in this country any longer, uh, because they were able then to make whole segments of what they were doing secret and uh, to decide their policies behind closed doors. Uh, I think the late 40s also dates a beginning of a connection between international drug trafficking and covert operations, and specifically reactionary covert operations or anti-communist operations. Peter Dale Scott mentions in Cocaine Politics that in the 1980s there was a meeting of the Central American Anti-Communist League, uh, some, of the, some of the most fascistic and reactionary elements in Central America, and that their general strategy that was developed at that meeting was to use profits from drug trade in their counterinsurgency warfare. Uh, and throughout this, uh, the, the role of the OSS at the end of World War II and then into the role of the CIA up into the modern period convinces me that the main source of funding for covert operations has been drugs. Well, there's a good argument for what you say. The, um, and clearly one of the problems that the book addresses is that we have had a half a century in the United States of, um, of intense secrecy. The Cold War was a period when much of what might otherwise have been known to us was kept from us. And it even goes back, uh, General Doolittle did a um, report to President Eisenhower back in the early 50s, I'm sure you're familiar with, where he said that to engage in the Cold War we will have to deal with activities that would be reprehensible to, repugnant to American values. And he suggested that, that President Eisenhower uh, inform the American people of this necessity and try to convince them that we might have to go by rules that Americans would not normally be proud of. The decision was, effectively, to go ahead with the covert operations, but not to tell the American people, to cut them out, uh, and then to lie and cover up when necessary. So under that rubric of the Cold War, a lot of secret and, and in many ways criminal activities were permitted, and the United States became involved with some very unsavory, repugnant people, as General Doolittle might have said. Uh, so, so, you had this, so you had that problem, and it went on for 50 years. And, and, and now that the Cold War is over, we're still being told, basically, that we're not going to be given this information. There have been a few outlets, there have been a few openings. I, the book talks about in Guatemala, for instance, just a year or so ago, when, the, when President Clinton did grant, did release some of the material to the, the Guatemalan Truth Commission. And what that Truth Commission came back with, based on U.S. government documents, was extraordinary, uh, saying that 200,000 people had been killed in Guatemala, that a genocide had been carried out against the Mayan Indians. Uh, the, the, the detail is, is disturbing and extraordinary. Uh, there was also a report that, uh, that a State Department official, Byron Vakey, wrote. In 1968, he had been in Guatemala and came out, and he wrote to his superiors upon leaving that, that the United States was, was involved with murderers, that the United States was tolerating and helping people who engage in torture and other methods that were not part of the American spirit. Uh, yet, that report, like so much else, was stamped secret and hidden from the American people for 30 years. And when it finally was released, this was in the midst of, of course, we were in the midst of Monica Lewinsky at the time, as much of this was happening during Monica Lewinsky for over a year, that uh, the Washington Press Corps could not take a break from the sex scandals to talk about genocide that the United States was implicated in, or about the CIA's admissions that its operatives were involved, deeply involved, in, in the drug trade in, in Central America during the 1980s. The Washington Press Corps couldn't, couldn't do that, or didn't do that. Uh, so your point's well taken, that we, and we do have this whole er era now, uh, almost a quarter of our history, 
that has been essentially blacked out or given to us in the most limited fashion imaginable. I often think that one of the reasons that they won't release the CIA official budget is that it won't cover their operations. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to ask a uh, follow-up on some of these other gentlemen brought up about the Foster case. I have looked into the Foster case and investigated it, and I've written a book uh, called Failure of the Public Trust, FBICoverup.com, and I quote you in this book because my co-authors thought you made some good points about the uh, failure of the, the Washington Press Corps. But you're failing now because, you know, you're covering up a scandal now that we don't want to wait 30 years for it to come well, out. If you go well, to but, F but, Let me finish my question. Well, my question to you is this. If you go to the Internet, if you go to FBICoverup.com, the American people can see for themselves whether you're telling the truth or whether I'm telling the truth. Now, no, the I've truth, looked, I've, the, I've, the facts I've, are there. And that. let me finish my question, sir. This, I listen to you speak. Question. It is a question. The question is, how can you defend yourself and you and your fellow journalists when the truth is up on the Internet? I mean, you say you read the Star Report, but there was a 20-page addendum attached with evidence of a cover-up. You seem to know nothing about it. You can't tell us about it, but it comes shrink-wrapped. I ordered the Star Report. Anybody can order it from the government printing office, they'll get the 20-page addendum. If you well, had well, in so truth so, so the question read it, is, how can I defend can myself? Can you tell is us about the 20-page okay, addendum? Is that the question? Yes, The question us. is that just because that, that a reporter's job is not to agree with every argument that's made, a reporter's job is to evaluate the evidence. And I have looked at this much more than probably I should. I spent a lot of time on this issue. And it, quite frankly, I, I did it when I was working for public broadcasting. We were doing a piece on the Clinton scandals. And... I went to the site, I went through much of the material, and there is Fort Marcy Park, but there is, there is simply no way, rationally, to explain how this could have happened, except as it was laid out by the FBI, by the county investigators, by the park police, by Starr himself, and, and it's just, there's not a, a rational argument or, or any serious theory that's been put forward of how it happened otherwise. And, and, but that's my, an my answer is this is what I looked at and I, just, I determined. You know, you can disagree with me. You're part of the journalism problem. Well, I would like to. Well, what is the truth according to this gentleman? Well, the truth is that the. I get to hear this guy ask the question. What I've heard is two different people, and I think there's probably three or four more who've come to basically talk about the Vince Foster case and, and hammer away at that. Exactly. Okay, so now, now, we have, now we have heard the let's Vince Foster... Airport, now please. we've heard about the Vince Foster story, okay. and let's discuss some other excuse stories. Me, I'd like to, I would like to... Excuse me, excuse me. I would like... I would like to introduce Brian Barger, who uh, is sitting over here. Brian um, is one of the, one of the um, great journalistic heroes of this era. He was... Uh, a person who put his uh, career and uh, a lot of his, uh, his reputation on the line to get at the truth, um, who uh, was instrumental in the, in the important reporting that the AP did uh, during this period in terms of both uh, telling the truth about the, what was going on with the Contra War, but also in particular the, the drug trafficking problem. Uh, and uh, I would like to just uh, note him. He, he, uh, he also worked for CNN and... Um, and other news organizations as well, but he's, uh, I, I still think of him as the guy that really was uh, a, key f a key figure in, in getting all this information out to the American people. So, anyway, yes, sir. Hi, um, could you evaluate some of the stories about Chinese espionage? I don't know if you've looked at them, if you think that that's been overblown somewhat. And um, on the Monica Lewinsky scandal, I, I was stunned that the media dropped it as soon as there were allegations that there was a third country with tapes of um, uh, Clinton's uh, conversations with Monica Lewinsky, that as soon as it might have actually hit a real issue, uh, it was dropped. I don't know if there was any credence to those allegations, if you could comment on that as well. Well, you know, there's... I'm not an expert on everything in the world. I'm sorry. <laughs> the um, I wish I were, but um, obviously the the I would look at the, the whole question of the Clinton scandals somewhat differently than other people have. I think um, we saw coming out of this this period of the 1980s and early 90s not just the the kinds of factual issues we're talking here, but there was a, there was a, there was another element here, which was an effort to control the media. And, and part of the book deals with uh, the press and so-called Project Truth. And, and parallel to these problems in, with the Contras and with other 
intelligence activities. There was an effort by the CIA, at least by the director, uh, William Casey, working through the National Security Council and a, a so-called public diplomacy team of the State Department to get the press into line. And many of us were subjected to a lot of attacks. Some people lost jobs. Uh, to try to, try to get the Washington press corps not to be as independent as it had been in the 70s. And, I, and this sort of goes on through the, through the 80s and into the early 90s. Uh, effectively, this was a way to protect the Reagan and Bush uh, presidencies as well. There was a great deal of concern among the conservatives after, after Nixon's uh, uh, forced resignation in, over Watergate and then the loss of the Vietnam War and the exposures of the CIA offenses during the mid-70s. So there was a reason for this kind of effort to get control of the Washington press corps. I think much of this, though, continued. And when President Clinton got into office, uh, that machinery that had been set up, much of it now in, in conservative magazines, conservative newspapers, conservative radio talk shows, and so forth, much of it just turned on him. This is not to say that there aren't things that, that President Clinton did that really deserve serious criticism. It is to say that many of them were exaggerated. And, to, and I would argue that what we saw in the disinformation or the efforts to so-called perception management, as it was called back in the 80s, uh, just continued on into the 90s with an effort to contain whatever uh, projects that President Clinton might have had. I think the Republicans have reached a point, I think, after almost controlling the presidency for nearly a quarter century, except for Jimmy Carter's four-year interregnum, that, that they really owned the White House. It was their territory. And I think they were quite upset about losing it. And I think that a lot of what we, we, we've seen in terms of some of these very, uh, I would say, minor scandals being made into major ones, travel, from the travel office affair, for instance, or, or Filegate, there was a real effort to magnify those, just as there was an effort to minimize the scandals during the 80s, which I think were far more serious when you're talking about uh, human rights violations and drug trafficking and so forth. Now, so I think that's colored how this has all gone. And certainly, I think it may be a point that uh, there may have been more serious questions raised in connection with the Monica Lewinsky affair. But I do think, you know, after a whole year of dealing with it, the, pro the press probably was a little tired. Uh, and clearly, it was not going to go to the full um, conviction of President Clinton uh, in the Senate. So there probably was a little backing away. And maybe there should have been some more attention to a few of these points. But I think there was a great deal of an effort to get at everything possible about President Clinton in terms of from Whitewater on through uh, some of the minor scandals uh, through his impeachment. Yes, Miss. Uh, Mr. Perry, I must say I have been an admirer of yours for many years. In particular, I remember one article that you wrote back in 1996 concerning uh, the Salvadoran situation. And uh, a reporter from the New York Times, Mr. Bonner, who had actually caught a U.S. Uh, Green Beret pretending, uh, going along in a patrol with the Salvadoran army. Mm -hmm. Then when Mr. Bonner wrote about it, uh, the Green Berets produced massive numbers of um, witnesses. I, I remember that very well. By the way, I miss it on your webpage. I went to your webpage today. I couldn't find it there. I request that you put that back up there again. Well, it should be there, but it might have, you know, things happen. Okay, I just want to let you know I'm a long-time fan. And um, I think it's marvelous what you've done in exposing the covert and illegal actions the U.S. has taken overseas. I'm a little concerned about your record on exposing the U.S. illegal and covert actions that take place on U.S. soil. In particular, I'm concerned about the article that you have on your website, not written by you, but obviously endorsed by you, by Molly Dickerson on Waco. In fact, there is massive evidence that's publicly available that shows Waco was overwhelmingly a uh, military intelligence event. I have here something that I downloaded from the Waco Holocaust Electronic Museum. They're public documents. There's no conspiracy theory in it. It's government issue. Now, if you have a look at this material, it's very obvious that the Waco raid of February 28, 1993 was nothing more or less than designed to fail. It was a domestic Gulf of Tonkin incident. Yet Ms. Dickerson, in the article that you're hosting now on the webpage, pretends 
The raid was a failed law enforcement exercise. She even makes the most laughable statement that the Davidians ambushed the BATF. Well, I think that was based on the on the on the uh, report that the that there had been that the uh, Davidians were aware that the that uh, the ATF people were on their way. But I th the point of that article is that there's a great deal of blame to go everywhere. It was. Sir. Look, would you have a look, and I'll bring these up to you. This is the wait. medical, the, the, um, this is the military equipment on hand at day one. This was, you're, you're, you're talking about these tanks and stormtroopers. You're talking about helicopters shooting into the building on day one. Well, but the, but That's the, not blame but, going but, around. Excuse me, but the, but the story, but the story uh, said that. The, no, there was, it well, it said, well, I didn't say anything, but the story said, the story, the story said that there was, a, there was a, an, a, an excessive application of force in the earliest raid. No, that's, that's, this is, this is a military invasion on U.S. citizens living peacefully well, in their own home. Sir, I'm just concerned that you've taken a dive on this issue. It breaks my heart. Well, I don't think we have, but these are hard, these are hard stories. It's not, that none of them come easily. You know, true. Well, I'd be, I'd be happy to look at it. I'll as I've looked at, I've looked at a great deal of this material. Go ahead. Is anyone else? <laughs> Anything on Central America? I have a question about the Kosovo yes. War, and I'm, I'm only asking this because I've seen articles that you've written about it, so I don't really think it's off topic. And in your book, you do criticize the press for being too docile on, on everything, basically. And, uh, well, uh, I noticed that you had criticized President Clinton somewhat on what you, I believe you referred to it as an info war, but I didn't read anywhere where you actually questioned the, the, the legitimacy of U.S. and NATO involvement in the war itself. And uh, so I would like to ask, do, do you believe the atrocities committed by the Serbs against the Albanians in Kosovo were, were comparable to those committed by the Nazis against the Jews in World War II in, in Germany. And as an aside, what is your opinion about prominent and respected World War II historian David Irving's harassment and subsequent lawsuit because of his claim that after 10 years of research in the German archives, he found no evidence whatsoever of a Nazi master plan to exterminate Jews in gas chambers? Well, I think the... Um on the question of Kosovo, um, we have written, we wrote a number of stories at our, the news, the, by the way, the website is consortiumnews.com, so if people want to actually see what we've, we've wrote, they can look at it. But the, um, uh, in, in Kosovo, we wrote, I think, a fairly balanced approach. We, uh, we were critical of, uh, of, of the way President Clinton uh, tried to sell the war in Kosovo. We, uh, we talked about how, uh, how he did not present the history of the situation as fully as he should have. He, he did make a one-sided presentation to the American people. And that that, obviously, in the sense of being a journalist, you have to be critical when someone doesn't give the whole story. And we were. We also, we had a piece about the bombing of the, uh, the television station uh, in Belgrade and raising questions about that. I did a, did a long piece about Clinton's approval of so-called information warfare um, against, the, uh, against Yugoslavia. It didn't actually end up, I think, being very effective but the idea was to use uh, uh, high-tech computer uh, means to, uh, to penetrate uh, into the computer systems of, of Yugoslavia and, and uh, disrupt them. Um, we actually we had an interest, there was a, a document that I came upon um, written in the Pentagon for people who, were, who were needed, to be, needed to know about this, these procedures but weren't really directly involved. It was called Information Warfare for Dummies. And, and the report in, in that sort of very lighthearted way describes the U.S. capabilities of planting viruses in enemy computer systems and, and disrupting information flows. Um, and in, information warfare has become sort of the hot topic inside the Pentagon and inside the intelligence community, uh, but is very little discussed in the Washington press corps other than uh, the U.S. being threatened by it by, by uh, hackers from overseas. But we have tried to deal, I think, thoroughly with that. We, and we did write about some of the atrocities, too, by the, by the, uh, by the Serb forces. So uh, it is difficult, especially when you're a small operation as we are, without much resources, to, to, to get the kind of first-hand information you'd like to have. I guess my question is, do you believe that the 
belief that the atrocities occurred with the intensity and the magnitude that that the in, in, mainstream no. news media said that it that it did, which I, I don't believe that there well, were. Well, I certainly I would not compare the atrocities in uh, in in Kosovo with uh, the the atrocities during World War II. Do you have any I'm just curious. Do you have any comment about David Irving? Because I've been hearing his name on C-SPAN no, on national public radio I, I, all not, this week. I haven't read that that book. No. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, can you tell us something about how the internet? Um, is changing the way news is um, the the way the news is getting out to people, um, and whether it will have what kind of effect it will have over a long period or even a short term period. Right. Well, we started uh, consortiumnews.com as a as a website back in 1995, and there wasn't much there at the time, really. I think Salon started about the same time we did. Um, uh, they've had uh, they've had more money than we've had, but the um, but I, I do think that the internet has the potential to allow uh, more diverse points of view to be to be presented to the public. Uh, the problem is that as we we're seeing, the, the internet is really evolving into a, into a, a shopping mall, an electronic shopping mall, and the major internet sites um, are pretty much the same as the mainstream television operations or, or print operations. So you have N uh, NBC with MSNBC and M MSNBC.com, I guess, is the largest, the one that's the most trafficked for any website. And we're seeing basically the internet become more and more like uh, conventional journalism, with both the good and the bad of that. Um, and I think the major uh, internet uh, operatives like AOL are increasingly moving in that direction, as we saw with the, with the uh, merger with Time Warner. So I think that the, the people that think the internet will be a panacea and sort of refresh democracy in a thorough way are, are, are being a little too hopeful. Um, it can help. It, more can be done uh, in terms of providing a diverse points of view, but uh, I don't think it's going to um, be the cure-all. Brian. Yeah, I don't have a specific question. I wanted to make a couple of comments. I hope that's not going to get me into trouble. All right. Um, I think that your book is, is excellent, and as I think your previous book, Fooling America, is also a very, very important contribution to our understanding of what was going on during the 1980s. Um, you and I spent several years in the trenches trying to dig out the truth in the face of forces that we did not understand, and frankly, I was in a state of, of disbelief largely as I was going through investigating um, people like Oliver North. I could not believe that a top official in the White House would be involved in some of the things that we were learning about. Um, I couldn't believe that CIA officials would be recruiting known drug traffickers to go down as early as 1983 to Central America um, to support a war that did not have public support in the United States to bolster them because Bill Casey was convinced these guys were, were losers and, and didn't know how to fight a war. Um, that institutionalized a relationship between drug trafficking and anti-communism. Um, and there are, there's a lot of evidence going back decades of U.S. government officials um, not just turning a blind eye, but under the guise of, of um, the ends justifies the means, um, finding whoever it is who necessary to accomplish their goal, which was fighting communism, whether that meant allying themselves with um, terrorists, murderers, um, rapists, with drug traffickers, um, it really didn't matter. I mean, what the CIA kept telling you and me is, well, you can't expect us to all be just hiring Boy Scouts. We'd never get our work done. I mean, that was the common line that we'd always get on the phone, and that was about as far as they would ever comment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what you have done in these recent years with your books, which I think is such a significant contribution, is to point out how important it is to document history. Um, Today, history is written by the people in power. And if we relied on the likes of the New York Times and the Washington Post to tell and document history for us, 
um, I think there would be very little understanding of what took place in the 1980s. Um, the United States government was involved in, in numerous criminal activities, um, condoning, um, protecting people who were involved in wholesale massacres, um, ongoing human rights violations. Um, drug trafficking was one part of it, but hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives um, during this war in the name of ideology. Um, and you helped put that into perspective. And the way that you did it was because you were such a good investigative reporter. I mean, since the day we met, I've always respected you for your ability to always be pursuing the facts and being able to put those facts together and follow an evidence trail. And I think that that's the, uh, a brilliant contribution that you have made to this. And I think that titling this book, Lost History, um, is as appropriate as the title to your last book on, on Fooling America, which was about this entire campaign, a government-wide campaign to, that they called public diplomacy, um, which was based on uh, this notion of Bill Casey's that came from, I think, his days in marketing in, on Madison Avenue, that if you, can, if you repeat a lie enough times, that people will eventually believe it. And that's the way the whole public relations apparatus in the U.S. government worked. And you and I were subjected to that on an ongoing basis. Well, so I just wanted to commend you for you your much. great work. But it wasn't just us. I mean, the problem was that uh, reporters across the board in Washington came under this pressure. And some of the stories of uh, people, reporters you probably never heard of, who had tried to do their job and ended up uh, finding their careers damaged or uh, ended uh, was fairly was was not uncommon at all in Washington during this era. I was in when I was covering a story in Haiti um, uh, back in '93. I I had a chance to have dinner with a woman reporter um, who had was one of Brian and, and my uh, real competitors. She was at Reuters in uh, Honduras at the time, and she described uh, the problems women reporters had in particular because this Central America was the first war that women reporters really covered in a serious way for in the United States. Um, and they were particularly susceptible to these kind of whisper campaigns that the, the embassies, the U.S. embassies in the area, or the State Department here would start about them having sexual relations with Sandinistas and that sort of thing. And the women wouldn't even know about these things. Uh, they were being accused of this unless they might, something, something might have been blurted out to them. And there was really no way for them to defend themselves. But it was those kind of techniques that uh, we saw across the board in Washington during the 80s, a very... Uh, there, there was a kind of siege mentality on this issue, and, 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 and Brian um, uh, was subjected to a lot of it, as, uh, as were people like Ray Bonner, the New York Times, and others. Anyway, yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about the, the economics of your website? And also, uh, I think since you, uh, your website published this book as well, correct? Well, yeah, my company did. Yeah. So. Um, and just, just how, you, uh, how you make a living. Well, not, we don't make a lot of money, I've got to say. I, I do jobs, that, you know, I do other work along the side when people wants, uh, want something done. But uh, the website, of course, isn't very expensive. Uh, the expense goes into the journalism. Um, and we do sell um, uh, print versions, uh, and that has raised us some money. And we do you know, solicit from our readers uh, if they have extra money they want to send us. We certainly, we certainly welcome it. But, um, but it has not been a particularly... Um, it's, we, we have not shown that this is a particularly viable financial model at this point. <laughs> You're not getting rich. <laughs> um, uh, let's have questions for people who haven't had a chance to have. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Mr. Perry, you said that, um, at least insofar as the drug trafficking is concerned, that with, there was a failure of the independent counsel, uh, Lawrence Walsh. Uh, there was a failure uh, of the press. Um, uh, and, and there was a failure of the Congress. Uh, now, the sort of the same thing is happening in a, uh, a civil rights case that I'm prosecuting in the district here. And I emailed you and told you about it. One of these other gentlemen already mentioned it's the, the information is at FBICoverup.com. Now, and you emailed me back, um, and I could tell by your email, without going to the specifics, that you really hadn't had an opportunity uh, to read a copy of the book that I have here with me that I gave you that was filed in federal court. So my question is very quick. Will, will, will you read it, and, and will you um, uh, give me some feedback uh, when you get an opportunity well, I mean, to I, actually I read it? I didn't read the entire book. I read 
I read uh, sections of that. I mean, I don't have all the time in the world to look at everything, and I've spent a lot of time on the Vince Foster case. And my conclusions are that he, that he died by his own hand, with a gun, in the park. And, and I have not seen any coherent explanation or serious evidence of anything else. And I, that includes what I, what I read in, in, in that book you sent me. So I'm not going to say something I don't believe. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to pretend that there's, a, that there's something more sinister here when my reporting finds that there isn't. What's the most persuasive evidence? Okay, think? look, we've had enough of the Vince Foster case. No, We're not, we not going to beat, no facts. Not no gonna facts. beat a dead horse to death. Facts. Um, uh, if there's a question on some other, something else, we will be happy I to... Let the guy over there talk for another 10 minutes about nothing. Well, let's, I beg your pardon? Okay, well, yes, gentlemen. Oh. Well, let me just add that even Ken Starr is at last going all over the tube saying that it was indeed a suicide. There's no question about it. And, uh, and what's he, the most persuasive evidence he presents, do you think? Um, look, I really don't Even, so even Vince I, Foster's I, family accepted it the day it happened. This gentleman I mean, in the back. Excuse me, excuse me. This gentleman in the back. I'd just like to uh, make a comment on the uh, the mainstream press um i worked uh about 10 years ago 12 years ago whatever it was in la for a group called the christic institute which at that time was pretty well known mm -hmm. and uh since it's you know forgotten history um and at that time we would put on forums and we invited a journalist and professor to talk about what was going on in in uh in iraq iraq the Iraq War. He had written for the New York Times and he was the head of a journalism department. He told me one time that, well, he had knew Central American well, very well, that uh, he called them and said, what's, you know, why aren't you guys covering this law Christic Institute lawsuit, which was going after the very same people that you've been talking about from the 80s? And he says that he called this friend of his on the New York Times. The, the guy told him, you will never see the name Christic Institute in the New York Times. Uh, and I think they did actually mention the name Christic Institute in the New York Times, but in a derisive way. Um, I, you know, I think that the New York Times did a very bad job on, on the contra drug problem, and exactly why I, I can't really tell you. Uh, but essentially, it, it, as this was developing, the New York Times was way behind the curve. Um, they didn't. Uh, understand the, the dimensions. There were the reporters they assigned to it were not capable, I think, of getting the story. Uh, they wrote stories that were blatantly untrue. I mean, they, there was a piece, as I mentioned earlier, I think it was 87, which said that there was no mention of Contra drug trafficking anywhere until after the Iran Contra scandal broke, which was in November of 86, when uh, the story that Brian Barger and I wrote at AP appeared in December of 85, almost a year earlier. And they said that there, the only allegations came from uh, convicted drug dealers, which isn't true either. Uh, why the New York Times took that position, that defensive position on behalf of the U.S. government, you know, I can't really speak to. I wasn't inside the New York Times at that point. But I know there was a lot of pressure from the, from the public diplomacy apparatus at the State Department, uh, this organization that William Casey was overseeing out of the CIA, um, uh, that there was this effort to intimidate the press, and it was very successful. Uh, I think a lot of reporters saw uh, a real chance to lose their careers if they pursued those stories and chose not to. Okay. okay, should we? Uh, yes, I, I we think uh, I, I want to thank you all for coming. I, I want to thank you, Bob. I think what you're doing is valiant and, and important. And even if you um, can't cover all the issues of the world, uh, you're, being, you can, uh, you're covering things that are really important and that we need to hear about. So thank you very much for thank presenting you. your book today. And we look forward to your new magazine. Thanks all for coming. Thank you. Robert Perry has been a member of the Washington Press Corps for 22 years. Lost History is published by the Media Consortium, online at consortiumnews.com.